Okay, here we go. First slide of our first lecture for Cine 104, History of Motion Pictures, 1945 to present. And uh, there's good old Buster Keaton, one of my favorite silent screen stars. And he is representing that our class is going to be structured and cover material somewhat like a tripod in three parts. The technology, which is film and sound and color and screen dimensions, known as aspect ratio, and the business side, which is very important, especially now with streaming and things like that. And my favorite part, art. And uh, the wonderful art, whether it's from whether it's from Buster Keaton or uh, the art of uh, Closer to Today, Stanley Kubrick, 2001, Wes Anderson, Christopher Nolan, the art, always a great part of the movies. And so uh, what I want to do is uh, fill in the 104 class because this class starts in 1945. And a lot of stuff happened in the movies before 1945. And imagine if you were studying American history and you started in 1900, uh, it would be assumed that you would know all about our uh, colonial era and the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. Um, but maybe we should make those assumptions. Maybe we should do a quick overview. So that's what I'm going to do with movies. A very quick overview uh, to lead us up to how we got to 1945 or thereabouts uh, before we uh, before we take off. So, uh, brief history. Edward Mybridge, yes, Edward is spelled right, correctly. Looks like Ed Weird. And he took pictures of a horse in action to settle a bet. And the bet was, okay, yes, I did that on purpose, does a horse at full gallop have all four of its hooves off the ground at the same time? And it's hard to tell. Horses move pretty fast. So he put a bunch of cameras uh, along a track with a tripwire going across the track. And as the horse galloped, they would trip the cameras. So, uh, I don't know, 10 or 20 cameras. And they came up with this picture. And we see that, yes, indeed, a horse does have all four of its hooves off the ground. There's actually a couple here uh, at the same time. And uh, whoever bet, uh, I think Leland Stanford, uh, that gave that has his name for Stanford University, was one of the betters. Um, and so if you can imagine uh, clipping these photos apart and, and, and flipping them, you get simulated motion. And so people took note of that and thought, well, if we can uh, get pictures of all that stuff, then, then we're off, off and running. So who invented motion pictures? Uh, and the answer is three people, three groups of people, actually. And that decade was the 1890s. Okay, so I don't have too many dates in this class, but that definitely is going to be one of them. Okay, when were motion pictures invented? And so the three parts. First off, George Eastman and uh, film up to the 1890s was done on uh, linotype and tintype and big things like that uh, with giant cameras and so on. And um, if we think, do we have photos, photos, we're talking photography now, not motion pictures, do we have photos of George Washington? And the answer is no, we don't have photos of George Washington. Do we have photos of Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president? Yes, we do, 1860. So somewhere between uh, uh, 1790 and 1860, photography was born. And that's just about exactly right, right about, right about, 19, right about 1830. Uh, early pho photography was uh, developed, so to speak. Um, and so there are photos of uh, Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. Uh, the exposure time was kind of long, so, so seeing people in action uh, they couldn't do. But if you stood very still, 
or in the case of the Civil War, uh, were dead, then, uh, then they could uh, take photos. So um, finally in uh, 18, somewhere in the 1880s, uh, celluloid uh, from George Eastman came in. Celluloid, and, uh, and uh, you can spool it, and uh, cameras could get smaller, and not very long after that, Thomas Edison asked Eastman, can you, can you put about 100 feet or so of that, maybe it wasn't 100, maybe it was 50 feet or so of your celluloid on a big spool for me? And Edison set his team, a whole team of people together, and said, we, I want to do something where the film can go through the camera and we'll take pictures that way. Lots of pictures, one right after the other, very fast. So it would be a hand-cranked camera, right? The, the camera operator would crank the film through the camera. I, I assume this is for panning and tilting here on the tripod. Uh, and so Edison uh, and his team, uh, uh, W.L. W.K.L. Dixon, I believe his name was, don't worry about that, uh, worked on the camera. And then when they had uh, movies to show, they showed them uh, what they, on what they called a peep show. So one person would put his eyes or her eyes up to the viewing and crank it, put a nickel in and crank it, and they could see a moving picture. And then the Lumiere brothers, um, they thought it would be nice to have movies with these moving pictures, right, moving pictures, movies, uh, projected uh, in a theater. And the theater experience goes all the way back thousands of years, at least back to the Greeks 2,500 years ago, probably a lot further back than that. And so that was a, uh, that was a good move, right? Instead of watching movies individually, we watched them in groups, at least until home video and streaming and all of that. So those three, right? And by the 18, about, about 1895, actually, right in the middle of the decade, uh, we have motion pictures, moving pictures, in uh, available to be shown in theaters. So somewhere around 1907 and 1910, film production in the in the United States, which had been mostly in uh, the New York, New Jersey area, filmmakers would go across the river from New York to New Jersey. They had uh, uh, trees and wild, sort of a wild area, not city, not city uh, scape, and they could shoot in New Jersey, even if they wanted to do westerns and things like that, but the winters are pretty harsh back there, and so at some point, one of the movie uh, uh, entrepreneurs said, uh, hey, take a camera, or a couple of cameras, and uh, some of your actors and actresses, and hop on the train, it would have been a train, hop on the train, and go out to California, sunny California. Uh, the real estate people tell us it's very nice and warm and sunny, and 350 days a year of sunshine. So out they went to California first to visit. They would have stayed in apartments and things like that, rooming houses, and then eventually they would uh, relocate and start buying uh, property and things like that, eventually putting up eventually putting up uh, sets and so on. Westerns were very popular, so this is a good representative picture. So the move to California. 1914, 1920, we have the rise of the movie star, Charlie Chaplin, and he is probably one of the few people that everybody in this class recognizes. He world famous, probably the most recognized person on the planet for a while, and fame is rather fleeting. There are a lot of big movie stars since then, big big movie stars, every bit as big as uh, every bit as big as uh, Leo or Brad or Tom or anybody like that, or one of the four Tom, uh, one of the four Chris's, Chris Pine, Chris Hemsworth, Chris Pratt, uh, Chris Pine, Pratt, Hemsworth, Evans, right? One of the four Chris's, uh, and.
and we think they're big stars, they're in our big movies, but just like Humphrey Bogart or Greta Garbo or Clark Gable, who are the biggest stars of the era, they, they have, their names have been lost for most people, and that's the way the Toms and the Chrises are going to be probably in 50 or 60 years. You have to be a pretty big star, like Chaplin, to be instantly recognized 70 or 80 or 100 years later. Marilyn Monroe might be another, maybe James Dean, but there aren't too many stars. Some of those other stars I talked about, like Clark Gable, he was the biggest male star in Hollywood, and, and most people today uh, don't know who he was, and that's not on uh, that uh, you're ignorant, it's just the, the fleeting fame. Fame is very fleeting, and, and uh, we, lose, we lose track of that pretty fast. So, movie stars. The studio system comes into being in the 1920s. It's kind of like a factory assembly line. We get mass production, right? We get mass production. It's a lot cheaper to make a bunch of stuff than to make, uh, make just one. They call it economies of scale. Mostly, they were Jewish immigrants from Poland and Russia and places like that. That mostly men that uh, founded these studios. The money men were back in New York City, but the directors and the actors and the producers and everybody were out here in Southern California. The early big six studios, MGM, Paramount, Fox, Warner Brothers, RKO, and Universal. And uh, they were the ones that were running things for the longest time. Those studios were, were uh, they made movies, they, pr they did production, they made the movies, and they distributed the movies. That means they made copies of them and sent them out. And then they owned the theaters. They owned the theaters. Exhibition. And that's called vertical integration. And if, if you notice, it's in italics. That's kind of a key for you. Things that are in italics are going to be important and very likely be uh, questions on tests and things like that. There's our good old uh, Chinese theater up there in Hollywood. And they owned chains of theaters. Now, that was a sweet deal. Generally, the courts frown on that sort of thing. If you want to buy a, a truck and you're in Michigan, you can't just go to the Ford factory and uh, knock on the door and say, hey, I understand you make uh, Ford trucks here. I'd like to buy one because they don't sell cars and trucks at the Ford factory. You have to go to a distributor. And uh, it's, a, it's a complicated deal, but um, that's generally the separation there. And they don't want vertical integration of much. And I know there are a few. There are Apple stores and Tesla shops and things like that. But generally, uh, the, generally, the courts frown on vertical integration. So there's one of our business terms. I told you there was a little bit of business. It's one of our business terms, and if you're a if you're a business major taking this class, um, that's great. There are lots of jobs on the business side of motion pictures. You get to you get to be a, a business major and all that, and then you get to work in the exciting uh, entertainment industry. So if uh, if you're not a cinema studies major, but maybe possibly a business major, you still could think about uh, working in. Entertainment industry, Hollywood, TV, Netflix, Disney, all that stuff, right? There are plenty of plenty of job opportunities for, for business people too. So they uh, this studio system, they had long-term contracts for their actors and actresses and, and directors and writers too. It's rather paternalistic, right? The root parent. Um, and so uh, actors get treated kind of like children, okay? It's a paternalistic system. Actors could be typecast, which means you are a cowboy, and that's what you do. You make, you, you make cowboy movies, and, uh, or you are a singer, and you make musicals. Judy Garland, somebody like that. And maybe you want to try something different, right? Maybe the cowboy wants to make a gangster movie or something like that, and uh, the studio system says, no, 
nope, you don't get to do that. Sorry, uh, that's not your type. You are a horror star, Mr. Karloff, or you are a western star, uh, Mr. Wayne, or a uh, musical star, uh, Miss Garland. So typecasting, and a lot of actors are going to not be a big fan of that. They're going to think of themselves as artists and want to try new things, stretch, not just make the same thing that you're assigned to. 1927, sound era begins. There have almost always been sound in movie theaters, uh, sometimes full orchestras, large, maybe 50-piece orchestras would be in a big theater like the Chinese theater. Maybe just a piano player or an organist, but uh, they, they weren't really silent. Uh, but in any event, we have sync sound with the, the, the lips moving and the words coming out in synchronization. That first one would be the jazz singer. There's another date. There aren't too many dates, but that's a pretty good one. And so uh, we're going to we're going to remember that one too. And it's the first talkie, the jazz singer. Very important movie. Kind of creaky by today's standards, but it was such an astounding technological breakthrough that was a big, big hit. In the 1930s, 34 to be exact, and there's another date. Sorry, there's so many dates here, but that's, this is kind of an important one. And... We have the production code, sometimes called the Hayes Code, referencing Will Hayes, the, uh, the head of, the, of that. And this was done by the studios. It's not the government, not churches, not municipalities, nothing like that. It was all done by the studios themselves. They could see the writing on the wall. There were people writing letters and protesting and forming groups and things like that, and they knew that if they didn't get a handle on it, then it would be imposed on them. So they, uh, they put their own code in. Now, this is what they call pre-code, right? This is part of the reason why they, they did that. This is the pre-code. You notice uh, and, uh, Jane there. Um, Marino Sullivan and uh, Johnny Weissmeller as Tarzan and uh, pretty skimpy stuff and uh, after the production code starts being enforced it had been around for a while but it wasn't really enforced very well sort of like the speed limit I guess then her costume got to be almost like a dress and his uh, also right so not just uh, uh, not just uh, um, live action uh, romantic type movies and and the the studios in the 20s they were kind of pushing the envelope they really were um, the movies about divorce and uh, uh, things like that and uh, a lot of people just weren't real happy uh, with that sort of thing uh, they didn't really show a whole lot but if the if the the, the boss and the secretary were alone together and uh, then they go into a room and close the door, then most people could figure out what was going on. And it was just that sort of implication uh, that people found objectionable. So uh, subject matter, little bits of nudity, some nudity, yeah, yeah, definitely some nudity. Violence, right? There were a lot of gangster movies in 1931 and 1932, a lot of gangster movies. Um, I think, uh, like, 50 or 60, I can't remember the figure, 50 or 60, I think, gangster movies. And so very loud, lots of lots of uh, Tommy guns, Thompson submachine guns, lots of Tommy guns, and all that. So sex, violence, nudity, language, situations, all of that. 1939, we have Hollywood's greatest year. Here are two that you probably know, and then there are a bunch of movies that you probably don't know, like Gunga Din and um, Nanachka and uh, movies like that. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. 
Stagecoach. Okay, some pretty good movies, but these are the two that are pretty famous that everybody seems to know about. Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz. Gone with the Wind has made more money once we adjust for inflation. Okay, the dollar doesn't buy what it used to buy. And well, I'll talk about, I have a slide on in, uh, adjusting for inflation, but uh, once we adjust for inflation, uh, Gone with the Wind uh, comes out on top of Avengers and uh, Titanic and um, Avatar and all of that. Wizard of Oz wasn't really a, much of a hit movie. It became kind of a beloved classic thanks to television. Thanks to television. It was, you know, people liked the movie when it came out, but it wasn't much of a hit. It, it came out as a response to all the money that Disney made off of Snow White. And Snow White was a huge hit. So MGM thought that they would try their luck at a sort of a family children's movie, and it didn't do very well at all. But it got bought by uh, television, uh, television people, television networks, and it was shown every year around Christmas time for 20 years or so, and it became a, became a favorite classic. So thanks to television, a lot of movies we sort of know about because of television. So two great movies, wonderful movies, Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz. So what makes a great movie? Well, it's the same sort of question we might ask about other arts. And, uh, and sometimes I like to talk about the Olympics uh, when we have Skaters, gymnasts, snowboarders, divers, they aren't, there's no tape measure or stopwatch for them. There are judges, as you probably know. There are judges. And so the judges are kind of representing a general agreement of experts for movies. And we could be talking about literature. We could be talking about uh, uh, Faulkner or Hemingway or Fitzgerald, somebody like that. We could be talking about painting, Rembrandt or Picasso. Uh, we could be talking about uh, music with uh, Beethoven, uh, theater with Shakespeare. Okay, they're all uh, generally agreed upon to be works of art. And so I'm going to condense that to consensus. And uh, so we have a general consensus that such and such is a great movie, a great book, a great play, a work of art. But that brings up another question because there are some things in, uh, in Gone with the Wind which is set in the Civil War. Okay, it's set during the Civil War and the way that blacks are treated in that movie, um, they don't resonate particularly well. Now, there's lots of old movies that, that, that aren't fully uh, woke, as, as we might say. Um, but, uh, you know, that's going to hurt the way people think of a movie. Now, all old movies aren't bad. When we see something like Casablanca, it's held up really quite well. And there are lots of old movies that have held up very well, including Citizen Kane. It was held up very well. But over the years, Gone with the Wind has lost some of its uh, luster. So uh, we need, um, does it stand the test of time? Th this, by the way, is from Citizen Kane here in the Cade Kane, and there's uh, Xanadu, his, uh, his castle. So does it stand the test of time? And uh, so really great movies, just like Rembrandt, just like Shakespeare, and so on, stand the test of time, and we're going to shorten that to perspective. Perspective, nice way to condense all that. So consensus and perspective, there they are in italics. That should help you out. Very likely going to be needing to know those, those words at some point when we have a test, something like that. Okay, and you might check out a little bit of Citizen Kane. You get a chance. There are lots of good 
clips and things on YouTube of Citizen Kane. I don't usually have time to show it in class, but it is a it is quite a movie, and you might um, you might want to check it out. Okay. So uh, part of what makes Citizen Kane as great as it is uh, the greatest film of all time, according to consensus and perspective. Okay. And it doesn't top every poll. It tops most poll. It tops most polls. It tops most. I think if we were to take an aggregate, it would come in first. There are other great movies that are usually in those lists. 2001 and The Graduate, Lawrence of Arabia, wonderful movies like that. Part of it is this wonderful cinematography, what they call deep focus here we have very close to the camera a little further back and then way way back and it's all in focus uh, and uh, so that's part of what made Citizen Kane uh, a great movie was its cinematography there's also uh, wonderful makeup editing the script is nonlinear there are uh, story it sort of tells his story through six different viewpoints so it jumps back and forth in time which is pretty unusual for 1941 so anyway, a lot of, lot of great stuff in Citizen Kane. Um, and that's a why, right? Experts are going to see that stuff. Experts are going to see, oh, wow, look at that cinematography. Look at that lighting and so on. And the casual viewer might not pick up on some of that stuff. I know I've learned about Citizen Kane over the years. There are, there's a commentary track. Unfortunately, it's not the director's commentary track from Orson Welles. That's Orson Welles right there. He was 25. There he is in, in older aged makeup. Um, uh, but he did not do a director commentary track. Uh, but uh, Roger Ebert, the film critic, uh, did. And I learned a lot from it, right? There's a lot that experts can see in something, just like experts might see Sean White on the snowboard. As far as I can tell, you know, if a snowboarder or a, or a uh, uh, skater or a gymnast uh, jumps and twists and turns and twirls and lands and they don't land on their butt then it looks pretty good to me and the next person might go up and and skate or jump or leap and land and not fall on their butt and it looks pretty good but experts are going to see all these minute little details in figure skating and, and gymnastics and diving and all that sort of thing the rest of us aren't going to see. All right, a little bit more technology here. Color, that should be in your syllabus. I get asked from students, when did movies have color? And sort of the short answer is movies have almost always been in color. Um, if you want to look up uh, this film, it's called A Trip to the Moon by Georges Méliès, and it's only 12 minutes long, and it's right there on YouTube, easy to find. I think it's even on Netflix, um, at least it was for a while. So it's hand-colored, frame by frame, and, and a 35 millimeter uh, uh, frame is only about uh, two and a half inches or so. It's only about two and a half inches, so... so Take this whole picture, squeeze it down to two and a half inches, and you have a pretty small area right there that would have to be colored in frame by frame. Uh, back then, there were about 18, 16, 18 frames per second. By the time sound came in, they landed on 24 frames per second. Now, the vast majority of movies use digital cameras, but there's sort of an equivalency of, of frames per second. So anyway... Early stuff, but colored hand by hand. And that movie's only 12 minutes long, so that was not going to be the main way movies would be in color. Then, in the 1920s, we get a bath process where an entire scene might be one color. Night is often blue. Deserts would often be tinted yellow. Jungles would be green. Sometimes sepia. Um, Sepia? I'm not sure. I, I ask my art students, is sepia or sepia? Uh, it's sort of golden brown, sort of a color. And then just regular grayscale stuff. So in the 1920s, there was, there was lots of color, 
in the movies, just not um, m multiple colors. Uh, in the later 20s, we do get two-strip color process. Douglas Fairbanks, the Black Pirate, I believe, from the 1920s, 27 or 28 or so. It's a two-strip process. Not quite all the way there. Um, I think it's red and blue, but not green, something like that. But you really need more uh, to do that to, for, a, for a realistic color process. And then in the early 1930s, we get Technicolor, which is realistic three-strip color process. So that's pretty much when we get a good color. Pretty much when we get a good color, 1930s. 1930s. I, I would ask a decade, not a year. This is 1939's Gone with the Wind there. Uh, beautiful stuff. Um, a lot of animation. Walt Disney really uh, jumped on color and used it for all of his animated films. Snow White, all that. Worked pretty well for, for animation. Uh, kind of unwieldy Check out, uh, check out the cameras. Okay, that's a monster. That's a monster camera, for sure. Okay, and there are three strips of film in there, right? Three strips of Technicolor film in there. So, and then they had to be layered and processed, and it was really uh, a, a, a big hassle. It's really a big hassle, and moviegoers like us. Um, we vote with our pocketbooks. How many, I ask my students when I can get a show of hands, how many have seen a 3D movie lately? And only maybe one or zero hands go up. We are voting, basically, that we don't really care. We don't really care if it's uh, 3D or not. And a lot of moviegoers back in the 30s voted, it doesn't really matter if it's in color or not. Now, they voted very heavily for sound. So people almost completely quit going to see sound, uh, silent movies, almost quit entirely seeing silent movies within about three years. Okay, three years it took sound to come in. Virtually 100% of movies were sync sound in about three years. But with color, it took about 30 years. About 30 years, right? There were plenty of black and white movies. Uh, maybe only half of the movies were in color by the by 20 years later, by the 1950s. And it's not till we get in deep into the 60s before we get virtually all uh, all color films. Now there are specialty films. Uh, directors will do a black and white film. Tim Burton did uh, Frank and Weenie in black and white. So you have this as your handout, so don't worry about writing this all down. Um, but we see that it took a while, right? 68 took a while uh, before films were in color from, from somewhere around in here. Technicolor, actually I think it's 32, not 35. Uh, but anyway, 1930s, pretty good color, and it's not till we get to the 60s before virtually all movies are in color. couple more terms that we're going to need to know before we get into our class proper. Double features. It used to be A movies and the second movie on a double feature would be the B movie. But often the A movie would have bigger stars and bigger budgets. So simply the movie that played first became the A movie in theatrical terms and the second movie became the B-movie. Now, there are plenty of great B-movies, including this one, Gun Crazy, great film noir, uh, but they didn't have the big stars and they didn't have the big budgets and all that. So, uh, kind of hidden gems, really, a lot of hidden gems for those movies. So, A-movies and B-movies. And B-movies in the 1950s sort of transition to become drive-in movies. And we get, like, Castle of Blood and movies like that movie studios sort of dumping their 
product into drive-ins over the summer. And uh, then when we get into the 1960s, when we talk about Easy Rider, and Easy Rider was a drive-in movie, and it was much more important than that. It's sort of a derogatory term. It's just a drive-in movie, not a big deal. It's just a drive-in movie. Okay, a couple more general terms for us. Auteur is the auteur theory from the French. Some directors exert a personal style, control, and vision. Here we have auteur Quentin Tarantino. Uh, there were plenty going back to the musical days, Busby Berkeley, and on through uh, John Ford with his westerns and Alfred Hitchcock with his suspense films. And mostly back then, the studios had the, decided the main look of a movie, the style, the aesthetics of the movie. But a few directors managed to sort of rise above that, and some French critics took note and started talking about auteurs, which is just the French word for author, by the way. So auteur theory, and this class is mostly concerning auteurs, and we'll talk about plenty, including including Steven Spielberg and Quentin Tarantino and the Coen brothers and so on. Okay, it's a term from English class. Third person, by far the most common uh, narrative device. It's sort of like the camera is telling the story. Okay, she, they, he, so on. If you remember your English class, but there's first person and first person uh, is very interesting, and we are going to uh, see and concentrate on a lot, a lot of movies that are really told in the first person, whether it's Double Indemnity or Sunset Boulevard or Clockwork Orange or Fight Club. There are some good, amazing first-person movies. And so in books, of course, we would write I, me, mine, but in movies, that is mostly done with voiceover. Right? And importantly, we hear their thoughts. We hear their thoughts, and that lets us get inside the protagonist's head. So that's a very important thing there. Really, really good. Now, the downside is that if the protagonist doesn't know something, then neither do we in the audience. Okay, so th they would be surprised and we would be surprised. Hitchcock liked uh, the third person because he liked to show here are these people in this room and there's a bomb that they don't know about. And he says, that's how you build suspense. We, the audience, know that there's a problem, a device, somebody's hiding behind the door, there's a bomb in the, in the closet, something like that. Um, and, the, and the characters in the movie don't. And so that's how you build suspense. So that's great, that's cool. Hitchcock, he's a master. But um, first person is also interesting because we can hear their thoughts. We get into their heads, and that's also uh, very important. Okay, and we have to watch out for the unreliable narrator. Now, Forrest Gump, we're, they're going to play that for laughs, um, but he's kind of unreliable. We're going to be in on the joke. He's going to talk about his friend bought him, bought him some stock in a fruit company, and that fruit company was Apple. Okay, so we're going to be in on the joke. He's going to get uh, rich from his Apple stock. Uh, but he's definitely an unreliable narrator, right? So, Tom Hanks, Forrest Gump, and uh, the unreliable narrator. So we have to watch out for that, too. And here is, adjusting for inflation, what we were talking about before. Value of money has changed over the years. Okay, there's a nice hamburger for 15 cents, french fries for 10 cents, and so on. Now, in 1940, the average school teacher earned about $1,000 a year. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but you could buy a car for maybe $500. You could buy a house for maybe three or $4,000. Uh, and so on. So everything was scaled down. A loaf of bread would be maybe 10 cents or 20 cents or a quarter, something like that. Um, so everything was scaled down. Yes, people, school teachers were only making $1,000 a year. Um, but, you know, uh, 
getting a hamburger and, and, and fries and a Coke isn't going to break the bank either. You, that would be less than a dollar. It's like, I don't know, hamburger, fries, that's 25 cents, and a, and a, and a Coke, I don't know, I, I imagine it's about a dime, so uh, 35 cents or so, 40 cents, you could get a pretty nice lunch. Okay, so that is um, as far as we want to go for part one. That is what I would uh, normally cover on the morning session of our uh, first class, or if it's a full semester class, that would, that's what I would cover on day one. So uh, thank you, and uh, if you haven't taken a break, now's a good time to take a break, and uh, we will uh, resume with part two.